Uh, it's great to have you folks joining us for today's workshop, The Ethics of Online Teaching. Uh, although uh, we see ethics uh, as a necessary component of, of many professional fields, such as medicine and law, psychology, and public health, ethics should always be included in a discussion of teaching, particularly teaching that's done online. Next slide. I'm Dan Cabrera, the Multimedia Coordinator here in the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning. I've actually been teaching online entirely since 2007, but I've had an online component since 1998. I have the privilege and honor to work with quite a few faculty at NIU. From time to time, I also review uh, courses uh, for quality uh, using the Quality Matters standards, and I really enjoy doing that. It allows me to improve my own instruction. I develop and deliver online workshops on the use of multimedia tools to enhance instruction as well as Blackboard related uh, workshops. I consult with faculty and I develop content for our department's website. Now I'd like to ask my colleague to introduce herself. Hi, I'm Amanda Smothers. I'm the teaching and learning coordinator in CIDL uh, and I've been teaching English for 13 years now almost, uh, teaching online for the past nine years, not exclusively, but uh, in um, conjunction with teaching face-to-face -face and hybrid classes as well. Obviously I've been teaching online completely for the past year during the pandemic. Um, I also work with faculty, deliver these workshops, uh, and I'm also a Quality Matters peer reviewer. I just finished a, a review as an external reviewer. Um, so that was an interesting experience. My very first Quality Matters review officially. Um, so I look forward to talking about ethics and online teaching with all of you today. Thank you so much. So I just wanted to kick things off briefly with a, a brief welcome and a few inter introductory thoughts, if I can, about ethical considerations for remote teaching. Um, and that's what we've been doing for the last year. And, uh, actually, these are the kinds of conversations that staff at the Center for Innovative Teaching and Learning have been having with faculty, uh, not just since the pandemic, yet, but actually well before that. Uh, but now it's been elevated now because uh, we're all kind of sort of thrown into the deep end of the pool. Uh, it's been about a year ago we're having to move this kind of emergency remote form of instruction. I'm not sure how many of you folks had been teaching online in the past, but for those individuals who haven't, uh, it was kind of a rude awakening. And just kind of figuring out as we move along how to do this has been a real challenge for some folks. And I know we're all eager to return to a more normal form of teaching and learning, uh, whatever that new normal ends up being. But I think it's safe to say that online in hybrid, uh, or however else, this form of teaching and learning, it's not going to go away. It might continue to be, it, it might not be the primary form of instruction, especially after everyone gets uh, the vaccine. And I think many of us hope that it won't be that, well, they'll get back to more of that sense of normalcy, but it's going to continue to remain an option, online teaching. And I think, you know, that uh, these conversations that we're going to have today not only are important now, but I think they're going to serve the institution as well as faculty and instructors later on. Well, moving forward, um, I did take a quick look at course delivery mod uh, modalities for fall. What are the expectations? Just to give you a peek at the thoughts of our campus as we think about uh, what teaching and learning is going to look like in the fall and then break down the courses that are currently scheduled. Um, as of a few weeks ago, about 63% of our upcoming uh, fall 21, 21, uh, 2021 courses, they are currently labeled as face-to-face. -face. We got another 11% that are hybrid, and then 16% that are fully online. And then there's uh, another 10% that's a mix of dissertation sections and clinicals of, of some kind. But so you get a, a, a taste of that flavor, right? That we're going to be going back to face-to-face -face experience. Yay! But online, as I mentioned earlier, has not gone away. So with this topic at hand of ethics on online teaching, there are five key areas of themes that come to mind. Uh, as I think about uh, what we might discuss, uh, what we're gonna drill into today. And I just wanted to briefly hi uh, highlight them and, and throw them out there. And this sort of highlights the importance of, of ethical behavior in online teaching. The first being accreditation and compliance. Now there are a number of requirements at NIU as an institution and that you as faculty, frankly, who may teach for, uh, yeah, for, uh, for credit 
uh, uh, courses have to be aware of in order for your program, the courses that you teach to be able to um, be offered uh, in which students or who are enrolled for those courses can uh, can also receive financial federal uh, financial aid, federal financial aid. So there are there are certain certain requirements, and we're not going to get into all the specifics of that today or get into the, into that. But the U.S. Department of Education has some guidelines for online teaching that we have to think about. Firstly, and probably the most important thing is to keep in mind as faculty in this uh, this particular area that whatever the instruction has to be regular and there has to be a substantive interaction. And that really means that when you're teaching an online or hybrid format, that that's that there's regular interaction between faculty and students. And that's just like you have in your face to face teaching that uh, that this is still happening online environments and how how that happens. And there's different ways, obviously, to, to do that. But uh, that's something we need to think about. Uh, and then there's there's other com other compliance items that may not be as critical from the faculty perspective, but are really important to us as an inst institution. Um, as we're serving students, and particularly those who are maybe outside uh, the state of Illinois, maybe they're, they're, you know, this is really distance education. So I'm just going to throw, throw that accreditation and compliance uh, piece, uh, which is something we really need to think about. Secondly, it's the quality of the experience. And so, you know, what ethical obligations do we have as faculty that when we're trying to provide our students with a learning experience online, making sure that it's the same rigor and quality as the face to face experience. It's a big question that uh, that everyone should be thinking about. A lot of faculty have grappled with that for for many years. Uh, but That question has come up again now during the pandemic. Now, some faculty have been teaching online for a long time, and they're fairly confident in saying that they can provide a better experience for their students online than actually face to face for a number of reasons. But that's not always the same for every discipline or for every faculty member. But that quality experience is something we want to think about. So that's number two. Number three is equity of outcomes. So now, uh, do we know when we're teaching online that the, the equity of the outcomes, how does it compare to the traditional face-to-face -face environment? How are we assessing learning and, and knowing that students are achieving that level of mastery? You know, our students are able to take more shortcuts because their classes are not face-to-face. -face. So, got to ask yourself the question, are we as faculty taking shortcuts in, in our preparation and delivery of, of, the, of our course content? and learning experience because, because we aren't meeting uh, in person with the students. Uh, they're not getting up in front of them. Uh, like we're you know, not staying in front of a classroom. At, uh, so perhaps at least at the same rate at which you would in, the, in, in an in-person environment. So that's third, it's the equity of outcomes. Fourth is student privacy. And I think this is definitely an area that we'll be talking about more today, but thinking about in relation to privacy in relationship to to outcomes. How are we protecting student privacy? How are we protecting faculty privacy for that matter? What's the data that's being collected in, in that process? Uh, you know, we often in the, in the online space, faculty, when we're looking uh, to offer uh, high stakes testing, right? You know, we wanna make sure that that, that testing is gonna be preserved, that the integrity, the safety, the security of that testing is gonna be preserved. So, you know, we, we might be thinking about proctoring tools because we're doing this online and other ways to try to secure the environment. Uh, and in doing so, there are considerations uh, in terms of privacy and student data that we need to be taking into account. And so I suspect that we may go down that road a little bit later, uh, later on in this uh, workshop. And then fifth and final, I just want to make sure that we keep in mind the importance of inclusiveness in teaching and learning on a lot, I think uh, all of the areas that I've that I've just mentioned, uh, it's very very important. Uh, this might be the one where we as faculty maybe spend the least amount of time, but maybe it's really important. It's an area that I know. I'm I'm always trying to improve my own online teaching, thinking about uh, what each of us can do as we're developing our online course or delivering our courses to create a welcoming and inclusive environment for our students. And so I've added videos, welcome videos, not just for as students come in for the first time, but every week an introduction to a module or a lesson. So there are, there are a few questions. So do we ensure that all of our course material are accessible? Um, to all of our students and to students that uh, whether they have uh, disabilities or not? 
Do we ask our students for their preferred names and pronouns? Uh, do we include case studies or examples or even images in our materials that represent diverse populations and applications of the concept of our courses? So there I gave you five key areas or themes, accreditation and compliance, quality of experience, equity of outcomes, student privacy, and inclusiveness. And now we're, we're going to uh, go to a portion where my colleague Amanda will be presenting. Amanda? Hey, so there are some obvious topics that arise when we think of ethical behavior in the online learning environment. The first thing that probably pops in your mind is cheating. Academic integrity is definitely an important consideration when discussing ethics and online teaching, but there are also many other issues to consider on both sides of the teaching and learning experience. We often think uh, that the student side of the ethics issue is important, but may not consider what is ethical from the teaching perspective. And I'll touch on both sides of the ethics coin in the first two topics today, um, the first of which is exceptions. So exceptions, leniency versus inflexibility, how lenient should professors be with students right now? Should we be sticklers for deadlines and rules or should we practice compassionate flexibility? The question of how much grace we should show students is a dilemma for classes in all modalities, but it particularly resonates for online learning and even more so during the pandemic. Should we be preparing students for meeting rigid deadlines when they enter the workforce, or should we teach them how to ask for extensions effectively when they enter the workforce? Um, so uh, there's a, was a review conducted, uh, an experiment with uh, about 10,000 employees and managers in the United States. And they found that asking for more time to work on an assignment was perceived positively by managers and it reduced employee stress levels and improved their performance. So um, sometimes in academia, we think, we think about what the workforce looks like, um, but our expectations of what that might look like and the realities might be different. So we need to come up with course policies um, for the right reasons and not because we think, you know, it's arbitrarily something that we should be doing. Um, so in one survey, and this is also an equity issue, in one survey, um, they found that 95% of employees asked their manager for a deadline extension received one. Um, but interestingly, employees and in particular female employees are hesitant to ask for deadline extensions because they fear that their managers are going to think that they're incompetent or unmotivated, even though those managers that were surveyed judged both the fem female and male employees who asked for an extension as more motivated than those that did not, with some exceptions. Um, so when they ask for an extension on a very urgent assignment, that might lead you to lead the manager to think of them as less competent, for example. But in most cases, it, that was not the case. So aside from real world applications and connections that could be served by teaching students how to ask for extensions and when it's appropriate to do so, there's also the issue of teaching and learning in pandemic circumstances. The circumstances at this point in the pandemic are you know, arguably less hectic for teaching and learning than they were a year ago when we were just switching over to remote teaching uh, unexpectedly. However, there are still some worries and tensions and challenges related to the pandemic for professors and students alike. So what role should those challenges play in how we approach to student extensions? Should they play a role at all? You might believe that we should be more lenient because of those added challenges and stressors. On the other hand, you might be of the mindset that students can take advantage of the situation by taking more shortcuts or coming up with more excuses because those classes aren't face-to-face. -face. So are these students who are coming up with more excuses or taking advantage of the rule or are they the, the exception? Should we establish more rigid policies to prevent the students who might take advantage or should we allow exceptions to account for the students who really do need them? Uh, are you finding ethical challenges in that tug of war between being lenient to or understanding of student needs versus the suspicion that a student or students may be taking advantage of the situation? So what are your ethical dilemmas regarding exceptions? And we'll kind of touch on that in our discussion in a little bit. The next talk about topic that I'll talk about is student engagement. Um, this is a, an oft discuss, discussed topic in regard to online teaching and learning. We want to see and feel that students are engaged in our online classes. Student engagement could be considered the level of interest students are showing in our online class 
or how often and deeply they interact with the course content, their peers, the professor, or how motivated they seem to be and whether they're progressing through the course. So for synchronous sessions, for example, you might consider students engaged, quote unquote, if they have their cameras on or they're using their microphones during conversations rather than or in addition to posting to the chat, or if they just look like they're paying attention and nodding along as you lecture and the little tile on the screen. Ultimately, online learning presents challenges with student engagement and how to measure it because we are physically uh, separated from our students. We're interacting from different locations on our own devices and even at different times of the day or week in the case of asynchronous components of our online courses. So some questions that you might be thinking of when you're teaching or planning to teach online are, how can I engage my student in the course content and learning activities and informative and summative assessments? How can I keep my students motivated and keep them showing up? How can I prevent my students and myself from feeling isolated alone in the teaching and learning experience? We might consider it easier to gauge student engagement in a face-to-face -face class, and we want to replicate that online. But that brings up a question. Should we be trying to replicate that same kind of student engagement online? Are there strategies that we use in the face-to-face -face classroom? Um, are these strategies that we use in the face-to-face -face classroom sufficient to engage students online or to gauge whether they're engaged? So in regards to ethical considerations with student engagement, in online teaching, particularly at this moment in time, we might consider on the one hand that engagement is critical to student success, but on the other hand, we want um, we and our students are surviving a pandemic. So in other words, there might be a conflict between learning and life balance. Um, another ethical consideration might be what can we reasonably expect for student engagement in an online class? What can we expect in a synchronous class? So for example, we, we may want or require our students to turn on their cameras for synchronous sessions, but does having a camera on really demonstrate that students are engaged? And can we really tell whether students are engaged by seeing a small live feed of them in a grid, feed of them in a grid on our screen? And then on the other hand, what can we expect for asynchronous engagement? Do we, for example, require students to log on a certain number of days of the week or to be present in the Blackboard course for a certain number of hours? Are those requirements evidence of student engagement or are they arbitrary mandates or are they a burdensome requirement for students who, for example, might share a computer with family members or who don't have reliable internet access um, and may need to work offline? So what are some other ethical considerations regarding student engagement? Be thinking about that as we go through the next couple of topics. Dan? Thank you, Amanda. Uh, so one of the things I neglected to mention in my introduction is that I also teach courses for the, with the College of Health and Human Sciences and specifically ethical decision making for healthcare professionals. And so I'd like to reset again by focusing on on uh, what we're, we're talking about ultimately, uh, and that's ethical dilemmas when we're talking about ethics. So in philosophy, ethical dilemmas, which are also called ethical paradoxes or moral dilemmas, these are situations in which an agent stands under two or more conflicting moral requirements, have to decide which way to go, how, how, to, how to proceed. Now, none of them really overrides the other. And it's, a, it's, it's close, a closely related definition characterizes ethical dile uh, dilemmas. This is a situation in which every available choice is wrong. Uh, I'm not sure whether I uh, I, I really totally agree with that, but when making decisions, at the very least, you want to have the least worst choice. So the reference to ethical dilemmas for online teaching is that online teaching environments actually can amplify the ethical issues uh, that are dilemmas that are faced by instructors and students. So let's look at synchronous versus asynchronous teaching. Now, synchronous teaching really refers to learning an uh, in, in event in which uh, a group of participants is engaged in learning at the same time. Now with the synchronous learning, participants can receive immediate feedback and that's that's great. That's the great value of it. There is an immediate response uh, to questions that they have uh, or that you know instructors can provide. Uh, now with asynchronous learning, the participants can learn at their own pace. The instructor, the learner, and the participants are not engaged in the learning process at the same time. So there's no real time interaction with the instructor or students. So the benefit of synchronous learning is that interaction between participants, which I believe 
I mentioned earlier, it's so, so important. Uh, in fact, that's like a government requirement. Uh, there's also the exchange of knowledge and experience between participants and real-time feedback from the instructor. So there's also a tendency to have training, which happens on a fixed schedule. This is when we're in a meeting in a face-to-face -face setting. Uh, you know, we, we have maybe classes three times a week at 10 o'clock, 10 to 11, uh, 11 45. We, uh, so, or whenever it, it happens to be at, at a specific time. Now, both types of learning, asynchronous and synchronous, uh, have their place in online instruction. But ideally, students should be able to experience personal learning interactions and interpersonal communications throughout their college careers, not just for one course, as well as exposure to a good mix of learning activities and a range of assessment types, including verbal and written assignment opportunities to ensure that instruction is meeting uh, a quality standard. And I talked about quality standards. It's one of the things that I, I enjoy doing. Um, now, one of the most challenging issues with online education are courses that are that limit interpersonal communication opportunities. For example, if an online course has any sort of discussion element, it's usually written discussion in the form of an online poise, uh, post, which is asynchronous. Now, for students looking to become more successful outside the classroom in any career that requires verbal uh, communication skill, this could be considered a significant uh, drawback. Thus, there would be opportunities, there should be opportunities for students to engage with the course content, the instructor, and with each other. And uh, those that can take place during a synchronous learning uh, activity, like right now we're engaged in a synchronous learning activity. Now the advantage of being able to view our students uh, in those video tiles, as uh, Amanda had mentioned, is that instructors are able to recognize cues that indicate when the students truly understand the materials or are confused. And so we're looking at like body images or maybe facial expressions. It, this makes it critical to select an appropriate technology for those synchronous sessions. Now, ideally, uh, that that should be easy, that you should be able to seek uh, something that, that's easy to implement. Uh, it, you need to implement uh, transparent media and technology solutions and being careful not to make things harder for students to use. And so whatever you're using, it should be relatively easy. I think, of course, when you're introduced to a new technology, whether you're a faculty member or a student, sometimes it can be a little, little uh, disconcerting is that, is that you're not as smooth as, as you can be or that you will become to be. And, and so the same is, is, is uh, uh, the case for, for the students. So this would be technology that is reliable, that's easy to use, that's easy to learn and, and to use for synchronous learning activities. Now, currently, NIU has access to a number of web conferencing or video conferencing tools, including Blackboard, Collaborate, or what we're using today, which is Zoom, um, uh, and also Microsoft Teams. However, ethical uh, concerns may arise in a number of, uh, of barriers, some of which were touched on by Amanda earlier. The first is equity, which is providing what people need, such as access to the internet, to have substantial bandwidth. Uh, it may be quite required in some of these synchronous activities, even have the appropriate equipment to be able to do that. And having a specific tool like, like a good webcam uh, or a microphone is really, really important to be successful, or at least an opportunity to be successful. And even just, just to have a quiet place uh, in the house, uh, which can be challenging if some students are at home taking care of children because of the pandemic. One of the things I'd like you to consider is the requirement to use a webcam. And this is actually speaks to the needs of the faculty versus the needs of the student. I recall reading an article that was sent out by uh, President Freeman a few weeks ago uh, about Stanford researchers and they identified uh, causes for a really interesting phenomenon. It's called Zoom fatigue. It's, it, it doesn't just uh, affect people using Zoom. It could be any web conferencing tool, but I guess this has become a generic term Zoom. And the quick fixes in which they talk about a number of reasons why we might uh, why videos might be counterindicated uh, to be using all the time. But the use of cameras in virtual sessions can sometimes challenge the idea of privacy. And in fact, even students have this perceived sense of, of, of being invaded. Uh, there may be a gender bias and being camera ready. I'm not so sure about it. It's, it just affects, you know, one gender more than the other. I think both genders are equally uh, 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 reliable or uh, uh, equally affected by this, this, and ultimately it might be vanity. I don't know. I guess everyone to some degree has some vanity and we want to make sure that we're putting in the best possible look. Whenever we're in the camera, in front of the camera, we want to make sure that we're, we don't have hairs out of place and all that. 
but sometimes that can be very restricting because we're uh, because we're all um, uh, all of the time, especially we have some of these some of these web conferencing tools actually have the ability to have everybody's video title displayed for all to see. And so it's like we're on all the time for everyone. And this can be a little bit exhausting and fatiguing. fatiguing. I know that all of us have turned off our videos, which is great. I, I'm, I'm all right with that. But sometimes just the fact that, that you know that everyone is looking at you the, through the whole time, as opposed to being somewhat anonymous, or even in a face-to-face -face class where you're looking at the instructor and you don't have all eyes on you as uh, in the other way for face-to-face. Which of course uh, is not necessarily the case for, for web conferencing tools. Another issue uh, is on accessibility, which is an important component because not all technologies have the ability, have the capacity to share information regardless of a person's abilities or disabilities. And so they, they really should be ADA compliant. But also even, even beyond just accommodation, uh, is application of universal design for learning, which is an approach that actually makes it easier uh, for the needs uh, to meet the needs of all learners, not just students with disabilities. And so you want to look at your technology that actually has that level of, of capability. So in this case, the way I'm looking at ethical dilemmas is that we have two competing interests. The pro being able to enhance interaction and support personal learning interactions by having a synchronous session and having the capacity to share the common space in real time and even be able to talk with each other and speak with each other. Now, the con side of this, of this situation, or the flip side, is a perceived sense of invasion of privacy or lack of equity or maybe even compromised accessibility. All right. So those are some of the, some of the challenges that we have in using the, the technology in synchronous and asynchronous teaching and learning. Uh, next slide, please. So this next one is on assessments and proctoring. It really has to do with uh, the idea of, of cheating prevention software using it and the purpose uh, to uphold academic integrity and the legitimacy of the university. Excuse me, I should turn off my phone. Okay, so we're talking about being able to conduct uh, those types of assessments, um, assessment strategies. Uh, in this case, uh, it would be looking at uh, testing or examinations. Now, typically in the face-to-face -face environment, we have an in-class uh, examination or you as the instructor, you're sitting there with your students in the class, taking the, uh, watching your students taking the exams, or maybe there's somebody else in there, maybe a, a GA, uh, but they're, they're proctoring, um, or that may even take place in a computer lab uh, where there was one person who is, who's proctoring the examination, but people are sitting at a computer so we really don't have that that uh, that option available as much because of the lockdown and not even computer screens. And so people are are really relegated to using uh, being tested or being assessed from a distance, you know, uh, from uh, from their own homes. And so the use of these proctoring software such as Proctorio or ProctorU, Examity, Respondus, these can be used to enhance protection and uh, and security. Now the data shows that students self-report cheating at the same percentage uh, in a face-to-face -face setting as they do in an online environment. So there really isn't that much difference between you know uh, the likelihood of people cheating, at least self-reporting it. However, there is a perception that technology is both the problem and the solution, and maybe it's uh, it's uh, it's something that we can talk about in the breakout uh, sessions that we have that that uh, we'll be conducting. So the pro in this, the pros in this position right here, is that we want to preserve and promote academic integrity, and that's a well, uh, that's a worthwhile endeavor, and we absolutely want to do that. However, that's being balanced on the flip side by issues related to equity, surveillance, data collection, security, invasion of privacy, and accessibility. So students need sufficient network bandwidth uh, with the webcam uh, for all of us for all of us to, to work. They also have to have uh, a quiet, uninterrupted space for testing, which meant, was mentioned earlier. Uh, now, the testing period, which isn't always uh, isn't always possible, as I mentioned earlier, especially with so many students living in, in a home during COVID-19, uh, maybe, yeah, uh, at noontime is not a good time to, to administer the testing. So some see this use of a proctoring examination uh, is not only unsafe, but actually a complete violation of students' privacy. So having students take an exam through what uh, has been described by some folks as spyware 
can be seen as unfair to students and their data. So one may ask the question related to data considerations. Who owns the data? When selecting the technology applications for use with students, uh, you uh, really need to consider what data is, is collected regarding your students, where, where that data is housed, and who can actually manipulate that data. And, and the bottom line is who owns that data. So then, do you as an instructor for an online course in Blackboard, do you post privacy policies for all third party vendors that you use in your course, including these uh, proctoring uh, software programs? So now there is a concern that proctoring software can read data from websites that, that you visit, that access your downloads, that view and capture the content of your screen, that access your app and privacy related settings. Now, some folks think that it's unacceptable in any circumstance for the university to track student keystrokes or access students' uh, computers, cameras, uh, film them in their homes, and, and maybe even using artificial intelligence uh, and te uh, this technology to determine if a student looks suspicious while they're taking their examination. And I know there's a number of alarming stories about students who are stressed out with this mode of proctoring, and they may be frequently flagged for the wrong reasons. Uh, in addition, the program may, uh, these proctoring programs may not always work for students with visual impairments who need screen readers. These uh, programs have been known to repeatedly flag as suspicious uh, students who, for instance, self-stimulate uh, for maybe for uh, those individuals who are uh, visually um, impaired. So, and that may happen during an examination. So many students report increased test anxiety due to the feelings of being surveilled. And even, even the glare of glasses sometimes interferes with the software. Now, in addition to this disability specific concerns, it's simply privacy and equity uh, advocates uh, who object to cheating prevention software requirements such as, as students uh, testing environments. So they take the camera and they look all around the room, up and down, in front of their computer, behind the computer, often in their private quarters prior to starting an examination or verifying their identities with their personal IDs or information IDs. Uh, so there's also issues with bias. Um, Non-white students have reported that facial detection software struggles to recognize their skin tone. Even students with head scars, uh, head, uh, head scarves sometimes get flagged. Although some of the uh, some of the companies will say that they never sell the information, that there's never the intention to sell student information, and that data is protected via military grade uh, encryption. Nevertheless, that perception uh, may still persist. So at this time, uh, Amanda and I've we've introduced four areas or themes that student exceptions and requests for extensions, for instance, the uh, student engagement that we try to build into our courses, synchronous sessions and, and, and asynchronous teaching and learning. And then finally assessments and proctoring and, and how we approach those, uh, those teaching. So I think the intention in introducing those is, is just raise uh, perhaps some, some factors that you're already quite familiar with in your teaching. But then also perhaps some facets are ways of looking at, at things that you're not familiar with. So at this point, I'm going to advance to the next slide, please. We have some questions to ask and um, we have uh, four people. So we could do a breakout session for uh, actually it would be three people. It would be three people in each group. Um, so these are some of the questions. When you have issues crop up in your own online teaching, uh, Let's see. Great. I'm going to move that. The tiles actually it's obscuring my view. All right. So when you have these issues crop up in your uh, uh, in your own online teaching, what do you do? OK, what are your current approaches to to these topics? How could you approach these things differently? And then what ethical dilemmas are you having regarding these topics? So I want people to just take a good look at these questions. I'm going to say them one more time before we break up. Uh, is that uh, one have these issues cropped up in your own line, online teaching? It may be that that's never happened before. Uh, or maybe you may haven't recognized it as possibly happening before. What are your current approaches to these topics? Uh, how could you approach these things differently? And what ethical dilemmas have you uh, are you having regarding these topics? All right, so I'm going to ask my colleague, uh, who's the host, 
to break us up into groups. Now we're going to be uh, in for about 10 minutes and we'll come back and we'll have a debrief. All right. So let's see. Uh, when you're ready to go. Great. Thank you so much, Amanda. Helps if I didn't have my uh, <laughs> my blocker thing on there over the um, no. thing. Let me put the topics and the questions uh, in the chat so that you have those. Oh, we've got the topics already. I already put those in there. Let me put the questions in there. All right. So just kind of open it up, whatever you want to talk about. You can talk about one of the, you don't have to, we don't have to talk about all four of these topics, but you know, if there's one that's kind of a pressing issue for you right now or something that you're more interested in talking about, then I'll uh, go with whatever you all want to talk about. So something that I've done, so I have my, all my classes are asynchronous online, obviously, but I added compared to my last semester, I added a um, synchronous session once a month so I can at least somewhat be more connected to my students. But one of the big things I always run into, at least with my undergrads, my grad students are really good about it, but my undergrads, I'm one of the only ones that has their camera on. And I ask them, oh, if you can please turn on your camera, this would be so much better because I don't speak just a black screen pretty much or just talk to myself. And then I have a few that turn on their cameras, but no one else really, but just undergrads, they always turn like all of them have their cameras on. And um, so what I did with my undergrads, now they have to work on a group project. So I put them in like little um, breakout rooms for each group. And even sometimes in the group, when they're just by themselves, they don't have their cameras on either. So when I hop around and I always announce myself first and everything too, I'm just like, guys, because I try to make it engaging and fun. I'm just like, you know, this will like boost team morale if you have all your cameras on, if you can see each other. And then one group ended up doing it, like turned all their cameras on. They were all by themselves. So it wasn't that they were in an area that wasn't, yeah. So they were in an own, like their own room or, but it was quiet around and everything. So I'm like, I wish it would be more, easier for them basically to just from the beginning on to turn their cameras on and not either having me ask them because I know you, you shouldn't really ask them to turn because they can be uncomfortable doing that but I don't really know how to do that because I wish they would just understand it's not easy for me either but I don't really know how to yeah make them feel I don't know better I guess. So what platform are you using for your synchronous I'm using, session? Uh, Microsoft Teams teams mm -hmm. so they do have I mean maybe you could show them how to do like their if it is a discomfort thing for some of them uh, so some of them obviously it's just I don't want to turn on my camera right now um, but if it's a discomfort thing for some of them then you could maybe show them how to do the backgrounds because this is mm -hmm. not my house back here yeah. this is <laughs> yeah. that's a background image um, but that would be one way of maybe saying, you know, if you feel more comfortable, if you don't want us to see your personal space, you know, even if you're alone, yeah. like you can enable these backgrounds and put something appropriate. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Behind you yeah, so that we don't see your personal space and maybe that'll encourage them to, mm -hmm. um, you know, I, when I teach, I'm always a fan of getting people to do the right thing by, giving them maybe some extra credits. <laughs> yeah. I'll I have a point if you want to turn it on. Yeah, at the beginning I thought because I only have one synchronous session a month. So mm -hmm. we only meet five times and during our specific class time. And then I get emails from students that say, oh, I have class during this time so I won't be able to make it. And I know obviously that's not true because it's during our scheduled class time. Mm -hmm. So I, and I don't want to be like, oh, you get points for just attending because it's something that you should be doing in the first place mm -hmm. but um yeah so I don't really have a high attendance again in my undergrad the grad students they're like 100 percent attendance all the time That's yeah I'm I'm that. definitely a fan of calling students out for 
<laughs> yeah. for lying that they have class when it, like oh well this is a regular this is a scheduled class so you wouldn't have been able to register for a class at the same time so can you know yeah <laughs> like I've had students I can't find this in our online class send me a screenshot so I can see what the problem is and then half the time they find it yeah magically magically yeah yeah oh but, there it is <laughs> <laughs> yeah one of the other things I luckily didn't run into at all because I've never done it before also this is my first year at NIU so I came at a time that wasn't the best but <laughs> and I never did proctor you or anything like that because what I just do um I decided to do that because of COVID and everything but I always open my quizzes on a Wednesday morning and they close Friday at midnight so they have those like two and a half days or almost three days to take it whenever it would fit, fit best into their schedule. Mm -hmm. Now in the reminder emails, I'm very communicative. Sometimes I think too much, but then it's better to do more than less, I guess, in the yeah. end. Because uh, I know there are some teachers who just say like an email for midterm and then for the final pretty much and that's it. But yeah. Yeah, no, maintaining that presence, um, especially when you're teaching online is really important. Um, you don't want to be the one of those professors who who only emails their students twice. Uh, and that's one of the things Dan mentioned, the um, the student engagement guide that we have, or the, the um, it was not really just student engagement, but faculty as well. So how to be present in your online course, we have a guide on that. And one, that's one of the things, you know, it has to be regular contact. It has to be, you know, instructor initiated and you know there's there's all of these different components to it but yeah they want to your students are more likely to connect with you and with the class if you they think that there's actually someone there <laughs> instead yeah. of you know just a computer screen yeah and then something that i did too um it's so frustrating to me so i had one student who asked if i could do voiceover slides and i said sure i'll do it and then um he said well only do it if you make it available to everyone. And I said, of course I would. I would post them on Blackboard. I'm not just sending them to you. And so in one of my quizzes, I just asked a question of like, um, what do you think of, of the voiceover slides? And then I gave them like four options and all of them were right, whatever they picked. But one was like, what, you have voiceover lecture slides? And then one was just like, I actually don't use them. I just look at this, like the black and white slides. And then I would say, oh, I just like prefer the colorful slides. Like they work fine. And I only listen to them if I need clarification. So I really only had two students who said that they would they really enjoy the voiceover slides and everyone else just like, yeah, I don't really need them. So I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> and it's like, oh, okay. <laughs> It'd be interesting to look at the grades of the students who use them versus don't use them and maybe yeah. like get some more information about what how they prepare for the exams and things. That might yeah. be just kind of an interesting little not to like punish them or anything, but, you know, just kind of a comparison, you know, how well do the voiceovers, you know, help those who yeah. listen to them. Because I have the student who asked me if I could, he's like, how about you just use our regular class time to do the voiceovers because you have nothing else to do during that time. I'm just like, mm, okay. And so I emailed him eventually at the end of the week, asking him if he had already listened to me because our class is always on a Tuesday and Thursday, technically. And he said, oh, I'm really busy during the week. So I usually do that on like the Friday afternoons. I'm like, oh, so you also have other things to do during our class time. Interesting. Because <laughs> like, like, clearly you have nothing else that you could possibly be doing. Yeah. So I'm like, oh, God. But yeah, I try to. <laughs> Like something I'm personally not a huge fan of is like doing a lot of um, like, because I try to keep it as low tech as possible, just because mm -hmm. I know that a lot of students have like either issues with Wi-Fi or some of my students emailed me before and because I did like a, what are some of your main concerns? It's like, I live out in the country, so I have really bad reception. So I'm not a huge fan of incorporating a lot of technology of like, oh, let's have like a, a quiz or um, like a pop-up, just like a poll or anything like that. So I just keep it mm -hmm. very basic and mm -hmm. I because I know I would have liked that as a student but I know the younger generation they're a lot more into TikTok and like I don't know a lot of other stuff nowadays so I'm like yeah that doesn't work for me and I just I'm more of like old school I guess compared to what they're doing but yeah yeah it's hard to engage students or I think our um 
attention spans are going down. I even feel myself <laughs> not able to pay attention as long. Like I'm watching a show and then I just, I start scrolling on my phone. I'm like, but I really want to watch this. Then I have to rewatch it because I miss things because I'm trying to multitask. Yeah, that's true. All right. I think we're at the 10 minute mark. So I'm going to oh, nice. bring everybody back together. We have about 30 seconds before everybody else joins us. <laughs> That's fine. Yeah, I think we have just 30 seconds now. 30 seconds. The, then the other group will <clears throat> will join us. OK. Um, like, I have a question. Like, I'm mm -hmm. teaching Oscarinus class. Um, <laughs> so how to uh, involve the students, like how to engage um, students in in class? Yeah, there's a lot of different ways. Um, let me get you our uh, some resources on that, um, and I will share those with you. Just give me a minute. OK. While you're getting those resources, um, Amanda, I just want to say we, we had a very engaging conversation in, in, in our group with Elizabeth and Bill. Uh, just really intriguing. Elizabeth is a, a GA or TA, and um, she's just, you know, starting her, her career. Bill has been teaching as a professor for 40 years, and he has 10 years uh, before that. So their level of experience is is quite different. Although I I'm happy to see that Elizabeth already is an advocate for her students, and we'll we'll, we'll talk about that. I'm just just wanted to share that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So are you getting something for for Marcella? Okay. Well, uh, yes, let's. Just, Let's just uh, start with uh, some of the issues, some of the ethical issues. Uh, Elizabeth, do you, you want to mention uh, your little little quandary of what students, you know, and and they're, you know, maybe missing some deadlines? Uh, for at least I I am a TA for the genetics lab, mm -hmm. and I've also had the opportunity to work with really great instructors, but for a lot of the science based courses, the deadlines are very strict. But with the pandemic, I've been able to advocate for and to the professor who actually grants the extension be more flexible in how we accept late work. Mm -hmm. And also just telling students, hey, you know, you can ask for an extension. Being an awareness there. How about you, Bill? Thank you, Elizabeth. Do you, you want to mention anything that, that might be perceived as an ethical challenge? I I'll, I will, but part of my job is um, I do debate this always in my head, but it's an impossible. There's no solution. Um, it's a subjective area, so it's hard to really do. But uh, part of my job is um, to assign the GAs and the we have the nine piano GAs, and uh, they have to do the accompanying for the other students. Like when the students play a what's called a jury, which I hate, but it's uh, at the end of the semester they have to play what's called a jury. Um, so uh, pianists have to accompany virtually everyone in the school. So I have to assign the pianists 
to different people. Well, how do you decide who gets which piece to play? Um, I, I might know somebody likes a certain composer, or doesn't, or does well with this or that, but some pieces are extremely difficult, and some pieces are much less difficult. And how do you, there's no way to perfectly equalize it all. And plus, to each student is at a different level, really. So some students, I really, I must give them music they can handle because it's for another student who's going to get a grade for their jury. Mm -hmm. So I can't, I can't force a, a weaker student that none of them are really terrible, but I can't force a weaker student to take a hard piece equal to what the really incredible student is able to play. So is that fair or not? I debated all this time, but I, there's, I don't think there's a solution really. I have to. Well, that's, that's the definition of an ethical dilemma that there, there is no one right solution, clearly right solution. I, I think I just want to mention this really briefly sure, is that, sure. is that, um, was there a, you know, uh, were you compromising your course, uh, having it in an online environment when you, when you were traditionally or typically using it uh, in a face to face setting like this, and and the, so the the rigor and the quality of the course experience for for students is also something that may that may come up. Okay, um, Amanda, did you want to uh, ask Marcella or Sagun? Yes. Um, do either of you want to share what you shared? One of the things that you shared when we were in our breakout session. Um, I just uh, talked a little bit about how. I think it's a little challenging for me when it comes to hosting my synchronous sessions that I only have once a month with my students to feel more connected, but then have especially the undergrads who are not willing to turn on their cameras. And then even when I put them into their breakout rooms with a specific group to work on their group project that they've been assigned, like they chose their own groups and everything, but some of them are not even willing to turn on the cameras then. And I told Amanda, I was just like, I try to make it like fun and just be like, Hey guys, like this will boost morale if you turn on your cameras, you can see each other, and then eventually they do it. And it's they are always by themselves. So it's not that they're in a room full of people or anything like that. And so it's just I think it's so hard for me to constantly push them to say, "Hey, it would be a great idea to turn on your camera because we only see each other once a month anyway, so you can really get to know each other." And I know I can't ask them to like or force them to turn on their camera. Yeah, that's a good point. <clears throat> the, the encouraging without making it seem like you're requiring it <laughs> is a fine line to walk. Um, Sagun, do you have anything that you wanted, wanted to share about um, any of the issues? Actually, uh, like some of the students, they miss assignments and they um, like after deadline, um, they told me. So in that case, like, um, uh, I need to uh, deduct marks or like some of the students, they say they suffer from Corona or their parents suffer from Corona. In that case, I need to uh, deduct marks, um, late penalty or. Sagun, so this is Dan. Um, last semester, fall semester, the university uh, sent out an email requesting that uh, faculty sort of have more flexibility in, in, in grading for those individuals who uh, students who may have been uh, who may need to be tested or may have tested positive and all that stuff. Did that have any impact on on your policies about about deadlines? Oh no, I'm just asking. Like um, in my uh, course, like if students. Say, um, submit assignment one day late, then we need to deduct 10% marks. So, um, and if the students, they submit, if they submit assignment after the deadline, um, and uh, if they email me that he was heard from disease, or he was uh, like, he had some issues. So in that case, uh, I'm asking you that in that case, I need to deduct mark or no. I think that's really up to you know up to you of what your what your course policy is. Um, so you know, do we you know not deduct or deduct points for late work? What are what are the policies around that? And can you build maybe exceptions into or is it appropriate 
or do you want to build exceptions into your syllabus, pol you know, your syllabus course policy of, you know, if you test positive for COVID, you know, you this this exception will be granted to you. So that's one of the one of the dilemmas, right? Is when do we grant those exceptions? Do we require students? You know, is it is it um, is it enough for us to require that students contact us about that before the deadline? Mm -hmm. You know, if they contact us after the deadline, is that too late? Um, you know, did they because the the deadline has now already passed? So is that a moot point at that point? Um, are they using that as an excuse? Or are they, you know, were they not able to to contact you beforehand because of of some other reason? So how long have they had to do this assignment? Um, you know, if they've had a couple of weeks and they're just saying they've just tested positive, you know, well, you know, there's so many variables, I think, with, I, I usually do it on a case by case basis, but <laughs> there's so many different variables. And, and I think that's, that's the dilemma there. So what, what is reasonable for you? And what's reasonable for students? Um, you know, I don't necessarily think that it's reasonable to accept to late work up until the last day of class from the beginning of the mm -hmm. semester. Um, some instructors do that, but you know, what is, I think you have to figure out what's reasonable for you. Okay. Okay. I think we've, we've come to the end of our, uh, of our session. I want to thank all the participants for sharing their, their experiences and all that. Um, it was an enjoyable uh, opportunity to uh, to share this, this, and it was a small group, but it was an, a very intimate, and and I appreciate everyone's willingness to do that. Uh, Amanda, do you have anything you want to ask or add? Uh, no, nothing to add for me. Um, you know, if anybody has any questions, you can obviously contact one of us. So uh, I've got our email there, but you'll receive an email from us um after this uh, a follow-up and i will add some resources to that for you all about engaging students online okay thank you so much once again and enjoy the rest of your day